Hello, welcome to the ZenLens online product overview and fitter certification. My name is John Davis, Senior Product Specialist at Alden Optical, the designers and manufacturers of the ZenLens scleral contact lens. This presentation will highlight several of the unique characteristics that distinguish the ZenLens design and the fitting set from other scleral contact lenses currently on the market. We'll review the dynamics of the lens design and how those features work in conjunction with ZenLens's creatively designed diagnostic fitting set. Once the basic design and fitting concepts are understood, we'll then review the basic lens fitting process, which I think you'll see is very simple and straightforward. Uh, finally, we'll explain how to obtain your ZenLens diagnostic set and complete the certification process so that you can begin prescribing the ZenLens for your patients. When Alden Optical decided to create a new scleral lens product to offer to practitioners, the company wasn't interested in just offering more of what was already out there on the market, so they solicited suggestions and ideas from several experienced scleral lens fitters, specifically asking for a sort of wish list of lens features and attributes that they'd like to see in a new product that might help them to resolve the most common fitting problems or frustrations that they ran into as they worked with other lenses. So this is what that list of most prominent features that uh, Alden devised as a result of the brainstorming session with the uh, other scleral lens fitters. Uh, one of the first things that practitioners wanted was a product design that would allow for one fitting set to cover the full range of eyes to be fitted in scleral lenses. So the Zen Lens diagnostic set contains two different basic design shapes, prolate and oblate. Uh, the one to fit prolate shaped corneas, the, including the normal corneas or those with keratoconus, and the oblate shape to fit uh, other corneas that you might encounter, such as post-refractive surgery patients or corneal transplants or pellucid marginal degeneration corneas. Yeah, each of these two basic shapes is available in two different diameters to accommodate both large and small corneas. Another feature that practitioners wanted was the ability to alter one aspect of the lens design or fitting characteristic without necessarily affecting other elements of the lens fit. So Alden developed the smart curve technology to create a kind of disconnect between each of the primary fitting parameters on the back surface of the lens. This allows for uh, individual adjustments to any one portion of the lens fit without affecting another. It, the smart curve technology also makes these types of adjustments very simple to achieve and at the same time allows for very straightforward yet sophisticated customization of the lens design to better fit the more highly unusual corneas when needed. And finally, of course, every practitioner wants a product that is both comfortable and healthy for the patient. Uh, this is often most determined by how well the lens lands on the patient's eye. Uh, so special consideration was given in the lens design to the Zen Lens landing zone. Uh, the advanced peripheral system of the Zen Lens provides a very generous, broad landing zone uh, with a multi-curve design to optimize patient comfort and health, ocular health. We'll talk a little bit more about each of these special features of the Zen Lens now. The Zen Lens 24 lens diagnostic set is arranged by combining the two basic lens shape, the prolate and the oblate, and the two lens diameters to create what is in effect four distinct mini sets of six lenses each. Each row of six lenses offers diagnostic lenses in one of the two lens shapes and in either the 16 or the 17 millimeter diameter. You can see the top row here is the prolate shape in the 16 millimeter, the second row is prolate in 17 millimeter, and so on. Each of these four mini sets covers a full range of about 1500 micron of sagittal depth differences, uh, enough to fit all but the most extreme corneal shapes and conditions. This diagnostic set configuration is not only comprehensive, but also lends itself to a very straightforward and efficient fitting process. So by matching the proper diagnostic lens shape and diameter to the patient's eye, a good fit can be achieved by providing the proper amount of sagittal depth where you need it. Uh, if you need it in the 
more peripheral areas, you use an oblate shape. If the greater elevated portions of the cornea are central, then you would use a prolate shape. And this allows you to use the Zen lens to fit everything from the steep keratoconic corneas to the flatter post-refractive surgery corneas, and uh, of course all the various shapes that corneal transplants can come in, as well as normal shaped corneas that might have ocular surface disease uh, or uh, patients simply desiring the enhanced optics of uh, RGP lens provides, and at the same time fit the full arrange, array of corneal diameters from small to large, essentially from 10 to 13 millimeters in diameter. And another unique feature of the Zen lens is the development of the smart curve technology. It's really critical to understand the role and function of the smart curve in order to fully appreciate the Zen lens design and to fully understand the how and why of, of making lens adjustments when you're fitting the Zen lens. So what exactly is the smart curve? Uh, the smart curve is the first curve immediately peripheral to the base curve and on the back surface of the lens. Its primary function is to create a kind of disconnect between the various fitting parameters of the, of the lens, essentially allowing you to make modification to one fit zone without impacting another fit zone. Uh, another nice feature is that it's self-adjusting. It, it does the uh, mathematics automatically in the software, so it saves the, uh, the fitter from a lot of uh, unnecessary time to try to make uh, compensatory adjustments or, or curve changes to uh, adjust for one change or another. You simply make the change you're looking for, to do and let the smart curve uh, balance it all out for you. And here you have an overview of the uh, Zen lens, uh, shows the various curves and fit zones relative to one another. It helps you to uh, visualize what we're talking about as we describe these various curves and their, their design and function. So you can see the central optic zone defined by the base curve, which pretty much covers the central nine to nine and a half millimeters of the lens diameter. Uh, peripheral to that is the smart curve that we just talked a little bit about. Uh, the next curve out is the limbal clearance curve, which uh, uh, vaults the lens above the, the back surface of the lens above the limbal region. Those three curves together, the base curve, smart curve, and limbal clearance curve combined to create that vault zone that sits above the ocular surface. The APS, the advanced peripheral system, is the landing zone, which is where the lens lands out on the sclera on the conjunctival tissue. And it's that, that strategic positioning of the smart curve that allows it to play that role of of acting as a sort of flex curve, which uh, allows for easy adjustments to just one, any one portion of the, the lens fit without uh, affecting uh, other parameters. For example, if the fitter just wants to change one aspect, you can make that change and leave everything else, the other fitting parameters uh, intact. For example, you can change the overall sag without having to change the base curve or lens power. You can increase the limbal clearance without impacting the overall sag. You can modify the base curve uh, or the shape of the lens to customize the fit without altering the overall sag or central clearance. One of the main points that needs to be emphasized here, especially for fitters who are used to working with other scleral lens designs, is that because of the fit zone independence of the Zen lens design, the base curve and the overall sag values are not dependent on one another. Uh, the smart curve allows the fitter to change one variable without changing the other. So if the fitter decides they need uh, an additional 100 microns of clearance over the apex of a slightly decentered cone, for example, they can just add 100 microns to the sag value when they order the lens. The smart curve will steepen to provide that additional sagittal depth and the base curve remains unaltered. So the entire central optic zone will be lifted up by the smart curve to achieve that final desired amount of clearance. 
this is a, an example of, of uh, uh, what this would look like from a cross-section view of, of the lens. The black uh, lines here represent a standard uh, Zen lens design that's in the diagnostic set. The, the uh, 16 millimeter prolate lens with a 4800 micron sag uh, has a 7.10 base curve. Uh, if a practitioner decided they needed 100 more microns uh, or 100 less microns of clearance, uh, they could simply order the lens with the uh, de that desired sagittal depth value and the smart curve uh, just beyond the optic zone will steepen or flatten to uh, provide that uh, change in the sagittal depth and the entire optic zone is raised or lowered. You can see here the red lines represent the increased sag, what would happen if you lifted that, uh, that sag up by 100 microns, and the blue lines represent the, uh, what the lens would look like if uh, you decrease the sagittal depth by 100 microns. And note the base curve remains the same in all three. Now this is another example that demonstrates how the base curve and sagittal depth values are not dependent on each other. In this case, instead of changing the sagittal depth, uh, what the practitioner can do here is make a change to the base curve while keeping the sagittal depth the same. Uh, if you do that, what you in effect are doing is moderately changing the shape of the lens to uh, create a little more uh, clearance or a little less clearance out in the peripheral uh, zone of the cornea uh, at the edge of the base curve. Uh, sometimes these base curve changes are also made to uh, affect a, uh, a change in the final lens power. Uh, for example, if you had a lens that uh, ended up with a final uh, Rx of minus 8 and you preferred to have something uh, a little less minus, you could flatten the base curve by a couple of diopters, make a modest change in the lens shape, and then you could order the lens with a minus 6 power. But again, the main point here is that changing the base curve uh, does not necessarily change the sagittal depth unless you specifically request a change in the sag value at the same time. The final item on the scleral lens fitters wish list that was presented to Alden Optical was to have a lens that was consistently comfortable to the patient, and one that offered minimal compromise to the normal functioning and health of the eye. So the designers of the Zen lens paid special attention to this landing zone area where the, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, or more precisely where the plastic meets the eye. Uh, the result was the creation of the Zen lens advanced peripheral system. The, the landing zone of the Zen lens is actually a multi-curve system. It's wider than that of most other scleral lenses, and this re relatively large surface area means the landing weight of the lens is more widely and evenly dispersed, and this dispersal means fewer areas of localized pressure or narrow bands of bearing on the conjunctival tissue. This results in the more comfortable lens and fewer instances of edge impingement or compression. Uh, of course, there's always those patients whose scleral curvatures or corneal scleral angles stray from the average or normal range. So adjusting the Zen lens peripheral system to match the steeper, flatter scleral shapes of these patients is as easy as specifying uh, one, two, or three-step adjustment to steepen or flatten the entire curve system to move the lens edge up or down. The, and the practitioner can also mix and match the two different APS adjustments to create toricity within the APS system uh, for those patients who exhibit greater than normal amounts of scleral toricity. Like everything else about the Zen lens, the advanced peripheral system was designed to optimize lens performance while simplifying the fitting experience. And here's a cross-section representation of one half of the Zen lens that shows how that APS adjustments look compared to the rest of the lens. Each step of APS adjustment will move the lens edge up or down by 30 microns relative to the ocular surface. Uh, assuming the inner aspect of the landing zone where it, it joins the limbal clearance curve is already resting on the sclera, seen here where that red dot uh, appears to, at the junction between the LCC and the APS, uh, assuming that is already resting on the sclera, adjusting APS alignment to move the uh, position of the outer edge of the lens up or down will have little effect, if any, on the amount of clearance within the vault zone 
of the lens above the cornea and limbus. It simply helps to realign the, the peripheral system to the scleral curvature and, and angle. Now let's take another look at the overall relationship of the various fit zones of the Zen lens and how they all come together to meet the requirements of a successful scleral lens fit. And, and this is how an, an ideal Zen lens fit will appear with sodium fluorescein instilled uh, in the tear layer between the lens uh, and, the, uh, the, and the ocular surface. You can see here a nice even uh, fluorescein pattern, uh, roughly, again, uh, 200 to 300 microns uh, uh, seen here centrally, uh, and the, the clearance extends all the way out to the peripheral cornea and across the limbus and where the lens lands at the beginning of the APS system. You see the fluorescein uh, essentially disappear as the lens makes surface with the conjunctiva. Now that we have a basic understanding of the design and dynamics of the Zen lens, uh, let's take a look at the, the fitting process. Uh, a lot of what we're about to cover uh, will be uh, represented in the fitting guides that comes with your diagnostic set, but hopefully this presentation will lend a little insight into the rationale for the, uh, the fitting approach that we're about to describe. So uh, just like any other scleral lens, there's three uh, essential uh, requirements necessary to achieve a, a good fit, a successful fit of the scleral lens, and the Zen lens is, is the same as any others. We need to, first of all, uh, achieve central vaulting over the entire cornea and the limbus. Um, typically, uh, the, the amount of clearance uh, may vary a little bit from patient uh, indication as well as uh, practitioner preference, but uh, uh, ideally we're looking for something in the neighborhood of three to 400 microns of clearance as you uh, begin the fitting process. Uh, we'll show some pictures to represent that. Uh, and so because we're looking for that amount of clearance, it was decided to, uh, in order to keep the diagnostic fitting sets at a manageable size that we would use 300 micron increments in the uh, diagnostic set as we move from one lens to the next across the row of each of the four mini sets. So if you see lens touch, you're going to need to vault uh, at least 300 microns to get the uh, close to the proper amount of clearance desired so that 300 micron increment seem to uh, make a lot of sense. Uh, as you'll see and as we've talked about uh, a little bit already you can vary the amount of sagittal depth very easily with this lens so you can order a sag value uh, in between what you may see in the diagnostic set quite easily. Um, limbal clearance is uh, a critical portion of uh, part of the successful scleral lens fit and again we we'll should discuss the different ways of achieving that limbal clearance if you don't see it in the, the diagnostic set straight out of the box. Um, however we feel the way the lens is designed in uh, most cases you won't need to make uh, uh, adjustments if you have the proper lens diameter on the eye. Uh, and then finally of course good scleral alignment we've talked about that already uh, an essential uh, fitting feature to make sure you don't have that edge impingement or, uh, or excess edge standoff for that matter. So where to begin? Uh, the first step of course as we talked about you have the four different mini sets so we need to decide which of those sets is going to be most appropriate for the patient. Uh, the first step would be to simply determine the, the proper lens diameter, whether we want to use the 16 or the 17 millimeter uh, design. So we simply look at the patient's uh, cornea and if you have a topographer that can measure the, the corneal diameter accurately that's great. Um, otherwise uh, however you want to evaluate a normal size cornea could in that 11.7, 11.8 millimeter range could probably be successful with uh, either the 16 or 17 millimeter design. So if you have a preference, you may want to uh, uh, select whichever, whichever diameter you're uh, partial to. However, if the cornea is a little bit smaller than average, you do want to use the 16 millimeter design. Uh, and if it's larger, that you want to use the 17 millimeter design. And this is all predicated on the fact that we want that APS landing zone to, to land 
beyond the limbus approximately a half a millimeter to one maybe one and a half millimeters beyond the limbus. Uh, the reason for not wanting to go further out, uh, some practitioners may prefer going further out in order to ensure that they have the limbus cleared, uh, is that the, the way the Zen lens was designed, the limbal clearance curve generates the additional sagittal depth needed to vault over the limbus uh, rather quickly. Uh, and the advantage of that is that you don't have to go further out beyond the limbus this when you uh, when you land the lens on the uh, ocular surface and the advantage of that is that if by avoiding that excess uh, uh, conjunctival tissue and incorporating that within the vault zone you eliminate some of the uh, the potential problems that uh, uh, are sometimes encountered with scleral lenses specifically uh, the conjunctival prolapse where that conjunctival tissue gets drawn up into the vault zone uh, is less likely to occur if you're if you're not landing too far beyond the limbus. Also the more conjunctival tissue you incorporate into the vault zone the more goblet cells you're going to also um, uh, in contain and and the potential for excess mucin uh, to accumulate within the tear film of the vault zone is also going to be greater if you if you land excessively far beyond the limbus, uh, as well as the increased scleral tericity that you're likely to encounter the further out you go. So ideally, with the Zen lens design, it was created with this whole notion that landing uh, somewhere half a millimeter to a millimeter beyond the limbus is going to put you in the, the sweet spot. So uh, there's your selection for your diameter. Uh, and then the other uh, variable you need to select to determine which row you're going to work from is the, the corneal shape, whether you want to use a pro late shape in the lens uh, or the oblate shape. So how do you determine which lens shape to, to use? Um, the, the, probably the best way it would be if you had topography, you could take a look at the uh, axial map or the elevation map, which is what we see here in this slide, and essentially look for are the steeper areas of the cornea uh, more centrally located or, or more peripherally located, or the elevated portions as we as we look at here. And, and the hot spots, the reds, the orange in this uh, topography tend to be more peripheral. Uh, and uh, so this would be a, a, a good candidate for probably the oblate lens. Sometimes it's not always obvious. Uh, you may have these uh, mixed uh, areas of elevation and steepness throughout the cornea. Uh, one uh, another method of maybe determining which shape would work best is if you have an asphericity measurement with your topographer. Uh, in this case with this MedMont topographer, the uh, Q value offers a very nice uh, handy way to determine whether you want to use a oblate or prolate design. If the Q value in this particular uh, situation is uh, positive, it's going to be an oblate shape cornea. If it's negative, it's a prolate. And uh, it's difficult to read, but the Q values at the top of that uh, black field there show that this is a, a has positive Q values on this particular cornea. And so again, just confirming that it is an oblate shape. Uh, if you don't have topography, you can typically uh, gauge uh, maybe by the patient history whether it's a more likely going to have the steepness in the center like a keratoconus patient or if there's going to be more steepness and elevation maybe in the peripheral cornea uh, as a post-LASIK type uh, uh, patient might have. So this uh, cross-section, another cross-section view of a prolate lens superimposed over an oblate design of the same sagittal depth. This will show you uh, the rationale for, for choosing an oblate shape lens versus a prolate. And again, we talked about where the elevation, where the corneal uh, elevations are more prominent if they're central. Uh, or are they peripheral? And so you can see here the oblate lens is outlined in the red lines, uh, the prolate uh, in the blue lines. Same sagittal depth, same diameter. The only difference is the flatter base curve of the oblate lens means that the smart curve immediately outside the base curve is steeper, creating that little bit of reverse geometry uh, to create the oblate shape. And what that means is you get more clearance as you can see here where the arrows are pointing, the red uh, oblate lens has more clearance in that mid-peripheral and peripheral corneal areas than a prolate. So when you have corneas that are more elevated in the periphery, 
the oblate design makes a lot of sense. Uh, if you have a prolate shaped cornea, ho however, you don't necessarily want that excess clearance or more clearance than you need in the periphery. Simply mean that would simply mean you have more uh, tear layer for the oxygen to trans uh, transfer through to the cornea. So um, uh, the prolate shape is going to be more appropriate. So this is a, a, a sort of a top view of what the diagnostic set would look like. You get a chance to see some of the numbers. A um, couple things I'd like to point out. You'll see as you move across the, uh, say, the top row here where it's the 16 millimeter prolate design. You can see the Z1, Z2, Z3. Those are uh, simply uh, designations of the diagnostic lens. Those numbers are etched into each lens so as you uh, the laser etching so as you work with the lens uh, on the eye you can see the number to confirm that the lens is in fact what you think it is and likewise when you're uh, cleaning disinfecting the lenses to put away you can verify that the proper lens is going into the proper vial you can also see the sag values uh, as I mentioned earlier they're in 300 micron increments moving left to right uh, in each row and also shows you the base curves. And if you want to take a peek at the, the prolate base curves versus the oblate base curves, as we just saw in the previous slide, you can see that difference. Well, the uh, oblate base curves tend to be anywhere from six to 10 diopters flatter than a prolate in the, the same sagittal depth and diameter. So the patient that we were just looking at, uh, we had decided we were going to be using a, an oblate design. The corneal diameter, I didn't really, uh, wasn't really measured, but it, it, it measures at just about a little over 12 millimeters. It's a relative, it was a relatively large cornea. So we would use the 17 millimeter oblate for that patient that we were just looking at. And then as far as your selection for the lens to start with, a good rule of thumb is simply to, to start with that third column down. Um, the 16 millimeter diameter lenses don't need to vault have don't need to have quite as much sagittal depth because they're vaulting a slightly uh, a smaller portion of the ocular surface. So typically row two, row three maybe for the 16 millimeter lens. I'm sorry, I should say column two, column three. Um, and if you're using a 17 millimeter lens, maybe column three to column four is going to put you into sort of the uh, average sagittal depth value for, for most patients. So once you put the, you've chosen the lens to start with, you put it on the eye with a little bit of fluorescein. And again, you're looking for those three main requirements to fulfill. Uh, the first thing you wanna look at is for central touch, if you see something that looks like the photo on the left where there's obvious central touch, um, you don't need to waste much time with that particular lens, no reason to let it settle. So you would simply take that out, move up uh, one, or maybe in this case, even two steps uh, to your right in that diagnostic row that you're working with. If you had just feather touched on the, on the first lens, you would probably go up one, 300 more microns and get you pretty close to the desired clearance we're looking for. In this case, because you see such a broad area of touch, uh, four, five millimeters of touch, uh, it makes sense to maybe vault up uh, 600, go, go two steps over to the right and uh, try a lens with 600 more microns of clearance and see what it looks like. The photo on the right again is our beauty shot that shows what the, a good fit will look like. Once you have clearance, once you've seen that you uh, have eliminated that central touch, it's a little tricky by that straight on look with fluorescein to evaluate just how much clearance you have. So you can certainly, if you had an OCT, uh, you, could, you could use that and get a very accurate assessment of the amount of clearance uh, across the corneal surface. Um, uh, barring that, the most common method is to simply use this uh, slit lamp cross, cross beam view where you narrow the beam, angle it at about 45 degrees, take a good look, and you can see uh, the thickness of the lens on the, uh, I think if you look at the photo on the left, you can see the, uh, obviously the tear layer, which is the, with fluorescein, the sort of blue-green uh, appearance. Immediately to the left of the tear layer, you can see that little bit of uh, glistening off the front surface of the contact lens, and you can gauge the the, uh, the, the thickness of the tear layer relative to the thickness of the contact lens. 
All of the diagnostic lenses in the Zen Lens fitting set have a center thickness of 0.35 millimeters or 350 microns. This, as we discussed, is uh, approximately the amount of clearance that you're looking for initially when you put the lens on. Uh, we assume the lens is going to settle like all scleral lenses do as the conjunctival tissue um, uh, uh, lens settles onto the conjunctiva. Uh, anywhere it's very patient specific but a settle of, of maybe one to two hundred microns uh, over time uh, and time can be uh, measured in minutes, hours, days, weeks, and even months. So you want to make sure you have uh, a little bit of, of uh, room to work with, a little margin of error, if you will, which is why typically you want to look for uh, maybe that 350 initially, and uh, as the fitting uh, process goes on, uh, at the end of the day, you want to probably maintain at least uh, uh, 100 100 to 200 microns of clearance over the uh, the most elevated portions of the cornea, which means you're going to have maybe two to 300 microns of clearance over the, the central portion of the eye. So as you look at the slit lamp again here, the beam on the left, you can see the thickness is uh, up top. It's a little bit narrower than the, the width of the lens, maybe about 200 microns of clearance there. As you move down, it, it extends to where the clearance is roughly equal to the the lens thickness. You can also see the cornea, the, the, the sort of hazy gray area immediately to the right of the tear layer. Uh, measuring uh, some patients, uh, practitioners will use the corneal uh, thickness as a, a, a gauge to compare to the tear layer. The issue there is, of course, you're working with irregular corneas. Often the corneal thickness is a little less predictable. So the, uh, the thickness of the lens makes a good gauge for here. If you look at the photo on the right with the next lens up from the set with 300 more microns of sag, it gives you a good idea of, of what we're looking at in terms of the difference between, say, 200 two to three hundred microns of clearance that we see on the left versus the five to six hundred microns of clearance that you see in the photo on the right. If you decided you wanted to order something in between, uh, simply between the 4600 sag on the lens, the left, lens on the left and the 4900 micron sag that you see on the lens on the right, you could order a 48 or 4750, whatever you deem appropriate for this patient. The next thing you want to look at is to evaluate the clearance at the limbus and peripheral cornea. Uh, this photo on the left you can see uh, appears to have pretty decent clearance centrally, uh, but there's an absence of fluorescein as you move out to the peripheral cornea. Uh, when you see uh, unacceptable limbal bearing, there's two ways you can uh, increase the clearance at the limbus. You can simply request a steeper limbal clearance curve. And you do that, we'll talk about uh, how you can simply request additional microns of, of clearance by the, generated by the limbal clearance curve. If you see as broad an area of touch as we're seeing on the photo on the left, probably the more appropriate solution is to go to a larger diameter to move that landing point further out so that the limbal clearance curve can generate that clearance uh, uh, more effectively over the, over the limbus and peripheral cornea. The uh, selection of the diameter is enhanced by some uh, dots that are put on the lens in your diagnostic set. We'll show you the markings uh, later. Uh, there is a series of dots that mark the beginning of the landing zone, the APS system. So when you put the lens on the eye, you can evaluate by looking at where the dots land relative to the limbus and give you a, a, a quick way of assessing whether it's landing uh, for, for further enough out, far enough out from the limbus. This is another cross-section view that we uh, looked at before. This one shows the effects of steepening the limbal clearance curve, requesting additional microns of clearance. Um, again here, this is that same 16 millimeter prolate lens with the 4800 micron sag. The black line represents the standard design. If you decided that you needed additional clearance uh, at the limbal region, you can simply ask, uh, give me another 100 microns, or in this case, as seen in this graphic, uh, that shows an, an additional 160 microns of clearance. The, the red line will represent that. So you can see that limbal clearance curve is steepened. It, it, it rises up a little more quickly to create that extra clearance. The smart curve 
the next curve in, uh, adjusts itself to maintain the same sagittal depth. So limbal clearance curve adjustments do not affect the central clearance. If for some reason you had more clearance than you wanted at the limbus, uh, you could also decrease the limbal clearance. And the green line shows the same effect. If you were to request 120 microns of less clearance, the limbal clearance curve flattens, the smart curve steepens to maintain the same sagittal depth overall. Good question is how much additional microns of clearance should I request if I see touch? A general rule of thumb is to uh, uh, look at the how uh, broad an area of touch, uh, how how many how large an arc of touch you have across the, around the limbus, and uh, simply figure about 50 microns of additional clearance would be needed for every quadrant in which you see some limbal touch or bearing. So if you saw touch simply between, say, 9 o'clock and 12 o'clock in that quadrant, you might just ask for 50 more microns. If you saw limbal bearing or touch all the way around the superior half of the lens, then you may want to go to for 100 or 120 microns of clearance. If, the, if that touch extends all the way around, uh, as we saw in the, that first picture, uh, that's, a, that's an indication that, that uh, you may have more uh, effective results by simply going to a larger diameter to create that additional clearance throughout the limbal region. And then finally, again, the third point uh, that we always look at when evaluating the fit, assuming we have achieved the proper amount of central clearance and assured ourselves of limbal clearance, is then we look at the edge alignment. And the easiest way to evaluate edge alignment is simply uh, with white light. You want to check and see if you have uh, any blanching of the vessels. If that edge is too tight and it's impinging into the conjunctival tissue, it can pinch off the blood flow. And what will happen is you'll see some blood vessels, maybe some redness building up outside the edge of the lens and immediately inside underneath the edge of the lens you'll see that blanching, that white area of white uh, uh, where the blood is not allowed to go through indicating that you have too tight an edge, in which case then you would simply order a flatter APS. In most cases flattening the APS by one or two steps will provide a significant uh, relief from edge impingement. Um, conversely, you could look at the edge. You may see where there's a little uh, break in the tear, the tear layer if that edge is sitting up a little bit off the corneal, the, the conjunctival surface. Um, and if it's too far up, you can even incorporate, you might uh, draw some air underneath the lens. It can create problems with the uh, air uptake. So uh, you'd want to avoid having uh, too much edge lift as well. And if you see signs of that, then you would simply steepen the APS by one or two steps. Once you've achieved the proper fit with the Zen lens diagnostic lens, the final step is to determine the lens power. So you simply over refract. Um, the important to note that every diagnostic lens in the set does have minus two power. The reason for that is that allowed us through the, uh, the diagnostic set to be made. So every lens has that 350 micron thickness that we talked about. Uh, so that every lens can be evaluated uh, for evaluating the tear layer thickness uh, regardless of which type of lens you're using. So every lens has the minus two power. That was also about the average power uh, of lenses the, in, from the beta study, the final lenses that were ordered. So the minus two helps to minimize the over refractions and especially in the prolate designs. So once you've uh, adjusted your over-refraction for vertex distance, factor in the minus two that's in the diagnostic lens, and that will give you your final lens power. And as we discussed, if you're modifying the sag value, you're increasing or decreasing the sag value from the diagnostic lens, simply the base curve remains constant, so you don't need to adjust the lens power. If cylinder is present in the over-refraction, then you need to use uh, corneal topography or, or keratometry. You first thing you want to do is to determine if that cylinder is due to lens flexure or whether it may be due to internal astigmatism on, on the patient's eye. So if you have toricity, uh, cylinder in the over-refraction, you want to determine if there is lens flexure. You see toricity in the 
keratometry reading or, or topography reading, um, then you may want to reevaluate your APS system and see if perhaps the patient uh, might benefit from a toric peripheral system. If there's uh, excess tericity in the sclera, that could be a source of lens flexure. And so by aligning that APS to match the tericity of the patient's sclera, you may reduce flexure uh, or eliminate it completely. Another option is to use uh, flex control, which is uh, simply a, a, a way of increasing the lens thickness. Uh, each step of flex control is 100 microns of extra thickness. And it's not merely center thickness. The flex control uh, increases the thickness throughout the, uh, the, the lens profile uh, all the way out to the landing zone, even in partway into the landing zone. The lens edge is actually going to be the same thickness, but pretty much from uh, everything from the edge in becomes uh, uh, increased thickness to, again, mitigate the, the possible flexure. If there's no flexure found, yet you still have cylinder in the over-refraction, then you know that there's a, a tericity or, or a cylinder within the patient's eye, and a front surface toric lens can be ordered with the Zen lens. Best way would be to call a consultation to discuss that. Let's take a couple minutes now to uh, review some of the markings that you may see on the Zen lenses that you order, uh, as well as in your diagnostic set. Uh, the, we have five images here that show some of the most common uh, markings that you're likely to see. Uh, starting with the one on the left, this is uh, what you'll see on your diagnostic lenses in your 24 lens set. Uh, each of those lenses will have six faint little drill dots that marked around the periphery of the lens. These mark the beginning of the APS landing zone. So you can you put the lens on the patient's eye to check the fit. You can also check to see if you have the proper diameter. You want to make sure those markings, those little dots, are landing beyond the limbus, ideally half a millimeter to a millimeter beyond the limbus. You can also see that there's a Z7 indication at the top. Each uh, lens in the diagnostic set will have a Z and a number representing uh, its diagnostic lens. This way you can make sure the, the lens is, uh, that you're seeing on the eye is in fact the diagnostic lens that you think it is. And also when you're cleaning the lenses and disinfecting them to put away, you can make sure they get put back into the proper vial. So you'll see Z1, Z2, Z3, etc. on up to Z24 um, on each of those diagnostic lenses. When you order lenses, if you order a standard lens with no uh, tericity on the uh, front or the back surface, you will simply get uh, a lens with a right lens will simply have a black dot as seen here, the uh, image second one, one in from the left. Uh, uh, left lens will have typically either no dots or if you re request we can put two black dots uh, to distinguish a right lens from a left lens. If you order toric peripheral curve, this is what you'll see in the uh, image in the middle. Uh, you'll see two of these faint drill dots also will be marking the uh, beginning of the landing zone, uh, and, and they will be placed on the flat meridian of the back surface of the lens if you have a toric APS. Uh, it's important that you note where those uh, dots align. Uh, they typically will align to the same place. They'll just sort of seek their own place on the eye. They will align on the flat meridian of the sclera. And uh, make a note of the axis, and that way in case you have to make further changes to um, the landing zone, steeper, flatter in one meridian or the other, uh, it'll make it much easier for us to get make those changes in the proper place. Or also, if you decide to order front toric optics on a patient with toric peripheral curve, we will need to know the axis of the flat meridian in order to get the optical axis aligned properly. Uh, also, those dots, uh, we can have a black dot um, to indicate the right lens, two black dots to indicate the left lens, uh, and we can place those dots so that they are at the six o'clock position um, on the uh, to help on insertion, so the patient can get those lenses to insert uh, with the toricity as close to where we want it to be uh, right off the bat. Uh, the left, the next lens over, uh, second one in from the right, would show uh, if you had a front toric optics with a spherical. Uh, landing zone. The f we rely on the thin zone stabilization system. The, the 
uh, little hash marks, lines that you see there for axis orientation should ideally be positioned at 3 and 9 o'clock, just like a, a soft toric lens would indicate the black dot at 6 o'clock would be 90 degrees uh, from the, uh, the those axis alignment markings. A uh, single dot for the right eye, a left eye again would have two dots at the 6 o'clock position. So it makes it easy to check for if there is lens rotation. We can make the, the standard compensation for that on a subsequent lens. And then the lens on the far right is a combination of a toric peripheral system with front toric optics. So again, you'll see the dot patterns that mark the flat meridian. Important to note what axis those are at. And then the uh, optical axis alignments at 3 and 9 o'clock. And we will put the uh, insertion dot at the inferior uh, location as well at 6 o'clock. Troubleshooting the Zen lens is very similar to uh, other scleral lenses. Um, in most cases, it's essentially an issue of just making sure that those three requirements are being met, that you have the proper amount of central clearance and without excess clearance. Same thing at the limbus, and then making sure you have the optimal uh, uh, APS alignment. This troubleshooting chart is in your fitting guide, and of course uh, this does not cover all the issues that you may encounter, but uh, what we're happy to report is that with the Zen Lens design, the basic design out of the box, we're seeing uh, relatively few of these uh, complicating issues. And um, there again, when they do show up, the modifications to address these issues are very simple and easy to perform. And here you see the standard parameter range of the Zen lens. Uh, we have the uh, sagittal depth range anywhere from 3500 to 6700 microns. Uh, fully customizable, actually in 10 mi micron steps you can uh, specify those sagittal depth in incremental changes. Uh, the two diameters we've talked about, the 16 and 17 millimeter diameters are available. Powers, lens powers, pretty much any power that you might need. The advanced peripheral system, we've recently expanded to now include uh, 10 steps steep up to and including 10 steps flat in 30 micron increments uh, in each step. And of course, we talked about the torque peripheral curves, uh, simply specifying different degrees of, of uh, steepness or flatness in uh, each meridian. And um, the different flex control thicknesses, front torque RX. The recommended material, our default material, is the Boston XO in clear. Uh, you can order uh, ice blue uh, on request or the XO2 material for, for those patients that need a higher DK value. So to order the lens, after you've done the fitting, you uh, can either just specify the all of the parameters. You can do the uh, little bit of arithmetic that's necessary, you essentially uh, adding or subtracting however many microns of clearance you want. Um, uh, tell us the lens, final lens RX, base curve, if you want the standard peripheral curve, um, or if you want any adjustments, flat or steep from that. If the standard limbal clearance is good, you don't need to mention that. If you do want something changed, uh, specify, yes, I'd like 50 more microns of clearance. Uh, or another way that some practitioners do is simply let us know what diagnostic lens they used. In this example would be the Z3, that 16 millimeter Prolate 4800 lens that you're getting familiar with. Um, but if you wanted 100 more microns, just tell us you want 100 more microns of sag, tell us the over refraction, uh, if you want more limbal clearance. So these two um, designations would both end up uh, resulting in the same lens, a 16 millimeter Prolate 4900 710 base curve, which is what's in the diagnostic lens the minus 250 over refraction with the minus 2 that's already in the diagnostic lens results in the minus 450 and you can simply get that 50 additional microns to relieve that little bit of touch that you may have seen in the limbus in one quadrant. You can either phone in the orders, you can email them to consultation or you can fax them and they, those orders will also come into consultation. So thank you very much for your time and attention. You now are well on your way to the process of beginning to
prescribe the Zen Lens scleral contact lens for your patients. The next step would simply be to complete the certification review exam questions. Want to make sure that the main salient points are regarding the fitting and design of the Zen Lens were made properly. Uh, once you've completed that certification, you can order your diagnostic set and uh, be on your way. Uh, please feel free to give us a call at uh, customer service if you have any questions regarding uh, the beginning of this process. And please uh, give consultation a call as you start working with the, the lens. We'd love to hear your experiences and, uh, and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you again.